Hey, y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherston Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, my dear friend, actress Yvonne Orji, talks to me about adapting to new seasons and the freedom to use new tools. Y'all, our conversation really spoke to my soul. After Dear White People ended, I was certain my next opportunity would be another TV show or maybe even a movie. Instead, God gave me this podcast. To walk fully in this new calling, I had to adapt some of my acting skills, like asking probing questions and active listening, to the task of stimulating insightful conversations. Yvonne reminded me that for new ventures, you need different talents. I finished the book and I'm like, great, now I have to unlearn some of those things that got me to success. And it's not because they weren't good, I'm just in a different season. And so you can't use paprika to cook for everything. You know, it's just like, paprika was great when we making like a bomb sauce, but now we making cinnamon rolls. You need, you need nothing. In her inspiring book, Bamboozled by Jesus, Yvonne outlines the many ways her faith both stretched and sustained her at different points of her life and career. Now as an Emmy-nominated actress and comedy headliner, Yvonne is in a new stage of her career, and she's unlearning the very skills that made her successful. Yvonne taught me that even when we're leveling up, we cannot be afraid to try something new, and we deserve the freedom to take that risk. And in our Sankofa moment, Yvonne assembles a tour featuring her favorite comedy legends. Oh, this is good. Can you imagine that tour? Hi, Yvonne, you're on the pod. I am so excited to be on the pod. Also, proud of you for having this daggone pod. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm proud of you for all of the things which we are going to get into on the pod. Um, But first, Yvonne, can you tell us the story of how we met? Do you remember? Oh, man. I don't know that I recall the first time we met, but I just know that we were meeting at auditions left and right. Yes. And, yes, 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 yes. But yes. what was the first time? Well, Tell me the first so time. I think I'm with you. I don't know that I remember like the first, first time, but my earliest memory of an interaction we had, I believe you were like a writer's assistant or you were someone's assistant working with Bentley Kyle Evans and yes. o- over there in Santa Clarita. <laughs> were you working on Love That Girl? Is that what you were working on? I was working on Love That Girl with Brisha Webb. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. Okay. And I was there auditioning for another show that was on the same lot. And I just remember we just connected and hugged and were like, all right, girl. And I was like, I remember being so impressed by you because I was like, wait, she's a writer too? Like, hold on, wait. Because at the time, I was very like one lane shouty. Like I was like, okay, I'm just doing the acting (laughs) thing. Even though I had, it's true. Even though I had always done a myriad of different things at that time, I was in my early twenties. I had the mentality of like, I have to just focus on this thing. So knowing that I had experienced you and met you in auditions and then seeing you being a writer, I was like, Oh, she's different. Hold on now. Wait a minute. So now to see where she's you are, it makes sense. <laughs> she's Nigerian. Is what, it's not she's different. She's Nigerian and she was poor. So she was like, I don't know which way God's going to bless it, but I will give him all the opportunities. <laughs> I was like... Oh, so got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Um, Yeah, so she's Nigerian, but also it all makes sense now because look at everything that I saw you doing then, you are doing it now tenfold. And for me, Yvonne, it is incredibly inspiring, especially because we come from the same place. We're both Maryland girls, you know, our birthdays are two days apart. That's how we connected. Because, yes, yes, because when we connected, it was like, you from Maryland, I'm from Maryland. And so we had a whole Maryland connection. Yvonne, take me to the beginning. Okay. What would you say both Maryland and Nigeria have given you? Woof. Um, I always want to say, like, what has being both African and American given me? Because that's kind of like what those two worlds represent. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. What has it given Um, you? Nigeria gave me, and still does, like, well, it gave me the work ethic that I needed. It gave me this superpower to 
<laughs> never believed that like I wouldn't be great. You know, it's like it's mm. like a thing. Like it's like mm. Nigerians are so bold, overconfident, prideful, whatever. Like good and bad. Again, two things can be true. In just this dog dogmatic belief that when when the Bible does say all things are possible, Nigerians are like yes, all things are possible. <laughs> like we're like like we take that scripture to heart. Like and mm. if it's not possible, it will be possible for me. You know. It's, so there is that that mm. drive that like. Who going to stop me? And and why would they even try? So, it, 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 yeah. And I, I think I took a lot of the things that most Nigerians apply to the, like, professions that are acceptable, right? The doctors, lawyers, engineers. I took that same energy into entertainment um, because it was, it was the only energy I'd ever known, right? And then America gave me, America gave me a lot of things. America gave me opportunity. America gave me, uh, faith, um, in a way that, um, I was able to hold on to and like actually personalize it. Um, it gave me opportunity access and also balance to be able to have this duality. So it's like, okay, well, here's where my Nigerianness really makes sense, but also here's where my Americanness makes more sense. Oh, so what, I have to say this first. I absolutely love your comedy special, Mama, I Made It. And I love it for a lot of reasons. Um, but what I love most about it is how much we get to know your parents. So I want to know what would you say is the greatest lesson your parents have taught you or given you? Mm-hmm. Individually or together? For sure. When my mom was a nurse at Howard University Hospital for 27 years, and I remember going to work with her and she would say hi to the like chief surgeon, like head of surgery. And then she'd walk down the hall and she'd say hi to the janitor. And, I, and you know, as a kid, you're just like, one of these is not like the other. Like, that's the janitor. Mm-hmm. He's picking up the trash. And the other guy, he got his name on the door. Like, he got a whole wing. Mm-hmm. And... I must have said something like, why are you saying hi to him or something like that? And my mom looked at me and she said, ah, you must be kind to everybody because you never know if you're entertaining angels without your knowledge. Mm. And it was that thing. Mm. I mean, that's scripture, but I'm so grateful for it because I see it all the time how people trick it off and mess it up in Hollywood. They act and they treat assistants like trash because they're just trying Mm. to get to the person at the top. And you you don't know, especially me who has an assistant now. I'd be like, how are they? Do I need to take a meeting with them? And and my assistant, this, she says, well, they were kind of rude. And that like they asked, like, I won't know. But I was like, oh, okay, well, cool. We don't need to, we don't need to meet with them. You know, and it's just mm-hmm. like, because they're the gatekeepers. But sometimes people just act like, you ain't nobody because I don't know you. I'm trying to get to your butt. And it's like, oh. Also, the person that's an assistant today is going to be executive tomorrow. So you might not want to do that. The janitor might be, you know, taking classes at Howard University classes. Medical School. And he's going to be the chief surgeon, you know, in 10 years. You don't, And your mama going to need the surgery that you didn't. You never know. You ne- <laughs> Listen. Listen. Mm. What my dad really did for us was preserve culture. I think he Mm. really made it his mission to make sure we never forgot home. Because it would have been real easy to be like, well, we're here now. Bye. Bye, Nigeria. (laughs) You know, he was like, "Uh uh-uh. Y'all going to come back home. Y'all going to see where your grandfather's village is. Y'all going to spend your summers here. Y'all going to eat the food. Like it was, y'all going to learn the language. So it was that thing of like preserving, you know, because a lot of times when people talk about assimilation, it's just like, we're American now. And it's just like, ah, I can't erase my, I can't erase either side of my history. And, I, and I'm grateful yeah. to God, to my, to my dad for that, for sure. You know, in the vein of what that major lesson that your mother taught you uh, or reminded you of, um, that there are angels among us and we need to treat people with kindness. Do you have an example of that happening to you? Like where you encountered what you would consider an angel on earth? Man, I have multiple examples of just when you have poured out and just been good 
And then like goodness comes from it. Because sometimes it's not from the person that you're good to that stuff will come. It's like you sow and reap, you know what I mean? Like you're just sowing, like you're being good to this person, but it may be somebody that you don't even know that came through for you. Like I remember <laughs> uh, I had this one professor, Professor Skolnick in, um, in undergrad. He was my undergrad public health professor. Um, Jewish dude who had worked in, you know, different countries in Africa. So he really took a liking to me. He was creating the first, I guess, uh, textbook for pu- for public health. And I helped him. I did some research uh, for him. Uh, he went on to teach either at another school. And he ran into like another Nigerian and was like, do you, or you, at this one, I had started doing comedy. He's like, do you know a Nigerian comedian named Yvonne Orji? And she was like, I don't think so. Cut two years later, I'm hosting, because uh, I used to host a lot of events. I'm hosting like a, a 50th birthday or something like that. And somebody comes up to me and says, do you know Professor Skolnick? And I was like, oh my God, I love Professor Skolnick. She was like, he's my professor. And he, I think he was talking about you when he was talking about a Nigerian. Da, 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 da. So I get his information from her. I, at, at this point, I'm in LA. I hit him up and he's like, Yvonne, one of my favorite students. What, like, what are you doing now? And I tell him, I was like, I'm in LA. You know, I'm, I'm really trying to just continue to make something of myself. It's kind of hard. He's like, you should meet my nephew. He's an executive over at Paramount. I was like, of course, of course your nephew's an executive over at Paramount. <laughs> okay. So, because it's like, what are the odds? This man, I know him from the public health world. And this is also the yeah. thing of like, there is nothing is ever wasted. You know, you could be like, well, why the heck does she want to got that degree? Nothing, nothing is ever wasted. Wow. Yeah. And um, he set me up with his, his, uh, his nephew. And at the time, his nephew was expecting, I think, his second baby. And he was like, I, I just will not be able to meet. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in over my head between work and home. And he's like, the, the, he gave me like a date, like two months in the future. <laughs> and I was like, I said, okay, cool. I said, but hey, if you ever need like a babysitter or any kind of help with the kids, I love kids. I'm a certified babysitter. Um, let me know. Come Baby. on, certified babysitter. <laughs> Listen, I'm not, I really was. I used to volunteer in the nursery at my church in LA. Mm. So it was like, no one loves the kids because they're crying. They got, they need their diaper changed. For me, I'm like, the babies are so easy. They want one of two things. They want to be changed, hugged, you know, fed. It's real easy. Or they're teething. Mm. Like, it's okay. Um, and so he wrote back and he was like, well, well, you want to meet next Tuesday? <laughs> it went from, <laughs> I got two months in advance to you want to meet next Tuesday. And I ended up becoming his Tuesday night babysitter. But every night when him and his wife got back, it was like a free executive coaching session. He was like, what are you working on? Mm. All right, where are you guys Mm. trying to sell this to? Like, I'm getting free knowledge that you cannot pay for. Yeah. And Mm. he's paying me to babysit his kids. (laughs) <laughs> so those are those moments. <laughs> exactly. Those are those moments where you you just, I'm glad I was a good student. I'm glad mm. I, you know, like all the things. I'm glad that like I was memorable enough in college for this professor to be talking to me to his other students who just happened to be Nigerian for me to just happen to be hosting a event where that said student is that for his Nephew to just happen to be in LA and happen to have kids. Like, it's just like you can't make all that up. Wow. Wow. I like that you said nothing is ever wasted. Nothing is ever wasted. Wow. No. That's really, really good. Yvonne, talk to me about a time. So you mentioned how like being Nigerian taught you basically that like anything is possible. Like you can do anything. Yeah. But I would say that we're in an industry that oftentimes is like, yeah, no, actually, I'm going to tell you it's not possible. Um, And so can you talk to me about a time that your belief systems about yourself and what you know to be true about yourself and the plans that God has for you did not align with what the industry might have been saying? And what did you do? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I find that, like, it's possible that you can be 
ahead of the trend, ahead of the time, ahead of the whatever, right? And so people are telling you, you can't do it. And I, I hate no's. And here's why. Because I don't know where this no is coming from. I don't like, I don't, and this is beyond industry, just in general. Is this a no because you can't do it? Is it a no because it can't actually be done? Is it a no because it hasn't been done and you don't know how it can be possible for it to be done? Or is it that genuine, actual, we have gone through the entire lineage of all the possibilities and it is a hard no? Very rarely, seldom is it the the last Mm -hmm. option. It is a no because somebody don't want to do it, can't do it, it hasn't been done. And so... When you when you're creative, when you're innovative, when you're pushing the envelope and you get met with these things, um, the way my nature is, I'm just kind of like, don't believe me, just watch. Mm. <laughs> and I and I just I'm like, all right, cool. I have to appreciate that you don't get it. And my past would always say, no today is not no tomorrow. And if they told you no, you asked the wrong person. And so I just gotta keep asking. Until the right person says yes. Or I become the right person and I don't ask no more. I just do. Yeah. Mm. What's something recently in your life that's taken you by surprise? Wow, that's a good question. What has surprised me is how much I have enjoyed discovering the real me. Mm, and wow. you know I say now like my favorite thing to say now is like nothing tastes better than freedom nothing and it is the work that I've been doing all pandemic to get back to me um, the me that I was always supposed to be but then all this other stuff got put on it and it's like well who who is me and it sounded crazy to be in my mid 30s to be asking like who am I because uh, then it's like, well, then who who was the person that was doing all this other stuff? It's like, no, that person was there, but there were so many parts that were that were out of alignment or that were working from a place of fear or anxiety or, you know, not the full authentic version of themselves. And so I was in there, but not the me that like I am now that I can show up and and just be and trust that that's enough. Or trust my good ideas, or trust that I don't have to prove myself, or trust that, oh my God, it's so, it's, oh, what surprised me is how much I really enjoy her. Um, because for the longest time, I was afraid to find me because I was nervous that if I found a different version than, than who I had always portrayed myself to be, uh, would I be abandoned? But now I can be like, we all got something. <laughs> and your something may not be my something, but I still deserve to be graced enough uh, to be here and to be celebrated and to be enjoyed as I'm figuring it out. You know, I used to think that I always had to, I, I had to present as perfect. So I had to get it right. And I can't, I can't let you see the dish until it's been, it's been cooked thoroughly. And it's like, now I'm just, I just invite people on the process. I let them know. The book was all about letting them know, hey, I just finished phase one of my life. If anybody is in this phase, something here may be good for you. I finished the book and I'm like, great. Now I have to unlearn some of those things that got me to success. And it's not because they weren't good. I'm just in a different season. And so you can't use paprika to cook for everything. <laughs> you know, it's just like paprika was great when we making like a bomb sauce, but now we making cinnamon rolls. You need <laughs> you need nutmeg. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, right. That's good. You know, and it's just like it don't mean that paprika is not good. And I lied to y'all when I told y'all to take paprika, but it's like no, nah, for this dish, paprika works. I'm cooking a new I'm cooking a new season of me, and so for, I need new ingredients, and I didn't think that I knew how to cook with cinnamon and and nutmeg. I didn't know. I didn't know that I would even like it. And now I'm like, yo, she's sweet. She's dope. And like, I only want to hang around people who support evolution. Anybody that wants to keep you boxed into who you used to be and who 
you know, and and because they got comfortable with that version of you because they could probably take advantage of that version of you. That's, I appreciate you, babe. We have to, and now we've come to the end of the road. So goodbye and God bless. Um, And it's so crazy because when you do the healing work, when you find, you find the people who are like, I have capacity and space for who you are. I love the you that you're becoming. I'm going to actually help you become a better version of that. And it's just like, what? Um, And it's, it's, ah, that's what surprised me. How much I rock with me in such a new way. Um, Yeah. (laughs) It's just, I mean, it sounds crazy, but it's, No, it doesn't. It sounds spot on. And the thing is like, you know, I love that you use the spices as an analogy because, you know, you go to somebody's house and they ain't got no seasonings. You're like, okay, so what is the food about to be tasting like? Because they only got onion powder, garlic powder, and Lowry's. We don't need a little bit more than that, right? But when you have paprika and you have nutmeg and you have cinnamon and you have garlic powder and you have the kosher salt and you have all of these different things, then you're able to be the well-rounded sponge that we were all really created to be. You don't have to stick with one thing. Um, and you can be skilled at using paprika and just as skilled at using nutmeg. So I, I love that and it deeply resonates with me. All right, so this is what I want to know, Yvonne. How do you stay open-handed? Sometimes what you believe for yourself and what the expectation is do not align. How do you manage your expectations in a real way while also knowing that anything is possible with God? It's more probably how do I manage my expectations with what I receive, you know? So mm. it's like, I expected this and I got mm. this. And it's just like, wait a minute, okay. guy. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> <The hell? laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, this was it. And it works both ways, right? You know, I have to see certain things as God's protection. I may not like it. I have to see certain things as preparation. Because while I think I'm ready, <laughs> you know, and God, and God checked me with this. It's like, as ready as I was for like my big break, m- my big break wasn't ready yet because Issa hadn't sold the show. HBO hadn't bought it. They hadn't developed it. They hadn't written it. So it's like, as ready as I was, mm-hmm. maybe in 2013, it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. no, the, the, thing, the thing didn't exist yet. As ready mm-hmm. as I was in 2014, it's still being developed. Okay, 2015. Okay, mm. and all that readiness matches the readiness of the thing. And so now, like, y'all can align. Wow. Um, sometimes it's just not ready yet. Because I'm with you, Yvonne. You kind of spoke to this earlier. Like, sometimes I've felt that, like, I'm, I'm in some ways, like, ahead. Like, the things that I want for myself, the things that I see myself doing and being a part of, I'm ahead of them. They just don't really exist yet. And I think, you know, you you using uh, that as a parallel to your, you know, uh, your experience with Insecure really deeply resonates with me. And it honestly gives me a lot of hope. Like, it's hope-filled. Like, because I want the right thing. Because if it's just anything, then it's not going to do for me what I intend to do. It's not going to be in alignment with my purpose in the way that it's supposed to be. So sometimes you have to wait. And and sometimes it's in you, right? Sometimes it's in the creation of a podcast, right? Like this is deeply in alignment with my purpose. I didn't wait for somebody to have this available for me. It aligned, but this was something that, you know, I carved out a space for myself. But other times you have to be okay lying in wait. It's okay. And the waiting season is not always sexy. It's hard because you because again, it's hard when you're like, I've done everything. Like it's it's one thing when you're you you ever try to pick somebody up from the airport and it's just like when you're the <laughs> one sitting in the car waiting for them to come out and then they make you circle around, you're like, come on, fam, where are you? Where where are yeah. like, what? It's what because it's like, I'm here. I'm here. I'm mm-hmm. I I got here mm-hmm. early. I'm here. Like, where are you? <laughs> it's just, I, yeah. I got gas on time. Like, 
it's frustrating to be the person where you're like, I showed up. On t- I did my part. There's literally nothing mm. else I can do. Like, I'm here. I'm at the right gate. So, you know, I didn't I didn't mess up. I saw your text. I checked to see what time <laughs> the, the plane was landing. I did it all. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. it's just like, yeah, I got held but, up in TSA. <laughs> yeah. Or, or it's like, yeah, I got held up in TSA. Or it's like, Oh, I stopped by C's Candies and picked up your favorite thing. Because remember the other day you said you were having a bad day and you're like, this is actually the best thing that ever happened to me. Thank you so much. I needed this. Like, you sometimes it's something like really minuscule. Other times it's because they had to bring you something you really needed and it took a little bit of time. Yes. And it's just like, oh my God, you was in there being thoughtful and I was out here being (laughs) impatient (laughs) as hell. (laughs) I was out here cussing you. All the way out. Oh, yeah, dang, my bad. You do love yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that's really we are killing it with the analogies today. This is I, I love analogies. This moving because <laughs> this was not oh. pre planned. Ashley did not tell me none of these questions, and we're just <laughs> no. in the flow. I love we're it. Just okay, Eva, I want to know what would you describe as being one of the toughest seasons of your life? Ooh, child. And who and or what helped you get out of it? Oh, man. I would say October 2014 to October 2015. Those 12 months changed my entire life. Um, I had reached the point where I was like, hey, God, um, one of us is a liar. (laughs) One of us is out here straight tripping. And you got me twisted. I I knew I was going through a, a depression because an opportunity had come my way and they kind of dangled it in front of me. And you know, when someone dangles something, you see the possibility, you see the hope, you start like making plans for it. And then it gets taken away in a way that you're like, this is some trash. I had built up, you know, all the eggs in this one basket. And so I remember just like, what's the point of getting up? Just, you know, let me just stay in bed. You know, I live with Esther at the apartment. I would just keep it dark (laughs) in L.A. when it's bright and sunny every day. And Esther would be like, I don't live with vampires. So we're going to have to get some air. And and I would then just like go to my room and isolate because I was like, well, she can have the living room. You know, and I just was like so secluding myself. So this one particular day, I went to the NBC uh, Stand Up for Diversity Showcase. And it's a showcase where you see people literally being showcased for like filming a short or doing like having talent and like making the first move. And then the NBC executives are like them, um, you know, let's give them a holding deal or whatever. And I'm so inspired by other people's talent, but it was the moment where you see like people, you know, and your friends and you're not jealous, but you're just kind of like, Hey God, seriously, if there's something else I need to do, let me know. Because I, I I feel like I'm doing everything you told me to do. I feel like I've maxed out. Like what what like stop stop the parables. Talk to me. <laughs> Talk to me real. And I think that was like the levee broke, and I was on Sunset Boulevard. My friend Hadi was with me, and I, like my knees buckled. I've never had a my knees buckled moment, and I just was like just crying and so upset with God. Like, why would you even sell me on this dream, fam? Like, I know I would have been really unhappy if I was still in Maryland right now, but at least, like, I would be fed. (laughs) You know, like, you got me out here in L.A. hungry, baby. And so it was just a real moment of, like, if I heard wrong, I am not so prideful that I cannot call home and apologize and tell them I will be on the first thing out in the morning. But I just feel like you ain't bring me this far to only bring me this far, but how much further we got to go? (laughs) You know, like that really was it. And in that moment, I'm crying on Sunset Boulevard and God tells me uh, what's in your hand. And then I get mad because I'm like, hey fam, 
I ain't got nothing in my hand. If I had something in my hand, I would be crying. <laughs> like, stop this. <laughs> like, you, I think you think you sound real holy right now, but I'm not, I'm not her no more. Like, you, you got to talk to me straight, Jesus. And <laughs> I don't know how y'all relationship with God is, but that's how mine is. And, uh, and I remember just being so pissed off and I just like, kept, I was yelling. Like people wasn't thought like, she's homeless and on crack because I'm <laughs> like in Hollywood, on the screen. Wow. Just like, so what you not going to do, Jesus? And I'm just, and Hottie's <laughs> like, hey, girl, you, you think we should turn on your street? And I'm like, nah, nah, nah. He going to get this smoke. <laughs> like, <laughs> right in front wow. of the billboards. Um, and so then I go home and I go to sleep because I'm at this one, I'm exhausted. You know, like when like kids cry and they just cry themselves to sleep because they're exhausted. Yes. They got oh nothing left. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I go to sleep and the next day I wake up and I like I grab my Bible because I'm like, let me see what this, let me see what this fool talk about. Let me see what this fool, this is how I feel. And in the Bible came a scripture that I'd never read before. And it said, I will yet trust you because my times are in your hands. And there's something about reading that passage, hearing what he had told me the night before, what's in your hand, reading the scripture, I will yet trust you because my times are in your hands. So then I'm like, okay, is this the answer? So basically you're telling me that I need to stop. Because also the, the, the reason for the breakdown is when you feel like you're running out of time, you feel like you're running out of time. And, and I don't know who is the curator of time, but like in terms of like time for what, you know what I mean? Like you're not, you're never running out of time. <laughs> like everyone is, everyone has a set time. So if you're 38 and you don't know that you're going to live to 102, you're actually not running out of time for anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're, you're, but if you're 24 and you, your time is up at 45, but you've accomplished a thousand things by the time you're 30, you didn't run out of time. You did everything. Ooh, so it's all relative. Good. Woo. Mm. That's good. Ooh, that's more, good. So, more so that changed, yeah, so that changed your perspective on so it changed my where perspective your life was. In, in term, yeah, and it's also kind of like who you trust in. You trust in your biological mm. clock. You trust in the naysayers. You trust in the community of Nigerians who don't know what you're doing. Who you trusting? Because if it's me, then you got to trust that, uh, baby, I got time in the palm of my hands. And if you mm. are in the palm of my hands and you're in time, you're not out of time, Oof. you're in time. So Whoa. I was like, this got me, this got me. Ooh, that's good. Oh, Yvonne, that is so good. So it allowed you to just kind of relax and then everything changed for you. And then everything changed. It, it, it lit a fire because he also told me, um, you know, that moment where you're like, I've been doing everything. And God was like, actually, you've been lazy with the thing I told you to do. And I was like, <laughs> so why? why mm, mm, mm. I don't like, I thought you was kind. I thought you was a kind guy. He's like, no, no you was coming yeah. to me out yesterday. So let me tell you about yourself today. And I was like, oh, okay. And he basically was like, I told you to do something and you haven't done it. You've actually been doing mm. everything else. But the thing I told you to do, thinking that everything else was going to get you where I told you I was going to take mm. you. So now mm. that I have your full undivided attention, are you ready to do what I told you to do? And I was like, you know what? Since we talking reckless, you got one more shot, Jesus. <laughs> <And> so that's, <laughs> that really lit, <laughs> that lit the fire. Because uh, he, he checked wow. me. And I was like, okay, that's fair. I, I was scared to do what you told me to do. That's fair. However... If I do what you tell me to do and it don't work, we're through. You find somebody else to represent you. It's not going to be me. <laughs> oh, my God, Yvonne. I needed that story so much. Oh, my. You have no idea how much that blessed me. Wow. That really, really blessed me, Yvonne. Mm. Okay, so I, I, I know what my takeaway is. But now I want to know what has been your takeaway from our conversation? That you are gifted to do what you do. And I'm so proud of you as a human, as a friend, as a person. Um, you make it so easy to talk to you and so lively. And you're beautiful. Just inside. Every time I see you, Ashley, I'm just like, so are you a porcelain doll? Are you one of those like, <laughs> like Russian dolls that like you just keep taking off and it's just like, oh, in the morning she looks the same way. It's, it's actually quite frustrating. 
<laughs> to see how beautiful somebody can be. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you so much. Um, my takeaway is um, just obviously just paprika how really that we have to have more spices. And we we have to have more spices. <laughs> It's actually funny you say that because that is part of my takeaway. My takeaway is that you're amazing. And I just, I learn so much from you every time I'm in your presence. And it's important to have friends like that, that you're constantly able to to take goodness from and give goodness to. I am someone, if you know, I like to cook, but I have so many spices. I have so many spices, like to the point where people are like, are you using all of these? And I'm always like, yes, I, because I'm an innovative cook. Like I like to cook with innovation. So I never know what I'm going to make or what I'm going to use, but it made me realize I need to apply that to my life. Like I need to remind myself that you have all those spices in your actual spice cabinet. You have them within yourself too. So, so grab them. Don't be afraid to grab them in different seasons. Don't be afraid to go back to ones you used in other seasons. Like, that really, 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 and we're talking about seasonings and seasons. Ugh, gosh, on. I love Come. it. Uh, I'm just obsessed. I'm obsessed. Yvonne, I thank you. I love you. I thank you. And I honor you. After the credits, the iconic comedic acts Yvonne would have wanted to tour with. Stay with us. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lentigua. This episode was mixed by Kojin Tashiro. Managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Assistant producers are Michelle Baker and Shanice Tyndall. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you did, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcast to ensure you hear the next one. If you were assembling a comedy tour of the most iconic comedic performances, what acts would you include? Oh, this is good. Man, okay. Eddie and either Roar Delirious, because like, oh my gosh. Or like Run Tell That Martin. Oh my, can you imagine the Run Tell That tour? I can ah. actually. I, I, I can imagine it. I can imagine it. I can. Uh, but speaking of which, my second HBO comedy special, Hold Me, is in these streets. So I hope you guys watch it. It's on HBO <laughs> and HBO Max. <laughs> ah! You just have done two. Like, no big deal. NBD, it's fine. I'm just doing comedy <laughs> specials. It's fine.